Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 2073. Buckle up. We're going to be talking racing today. Be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah! Today I'm in beautiful Santa Barbara, California, with a very special guest by the name of Tom Agloy. Tom, welcome to Cars Yeah! Do you have it in gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? <laughs> Absolutely, Mark. It's nice to have you here. Now, that's a really a ridiculous question to ask a guy like you, because in the racing world, you are quite the legend. You've been there, done that. You've done just about everything, and we're going to talk about your life. But before I give you a proper introduction and we dive into your world What's one little thing that maybe people may not know about you, Tom? Well, that's an interesting question. I think one of the most interesting things for me is that I started racing in a little Austin Healy bug-eyed Sprite. And today, most people don't even know what that is. You know, it, it had a whopping 948 cc's, and uh, I don't even know how many horsepower, but for sure I lied about it a lot <laughs> and, and, and exaggerated the number quite a bit. Mainly in the day when I started, you had to be 21. And so quite a difference from today. Most people don't realize that. It was at some kind of insurance requirement mm -hmm. or something. And so when I was kind of introduced to racing, I was maybe 17 years old or something, sports car racing. And I just wanted to go and, and actually race when I was 21. That became a goal. And uh, now today, you know, you can be like 12, I think. So think, think of all the years I gave up. <laughs> you know, I've had hundreds of professional race car drivers. I just had a young woman who races in the W Series who's 16 in, on the show a couple of weeks ago. My youngest racer, I believe, was 12. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, Go-karts and was stepping. He, he was a year away from stepping into racing Miatas, you know, and couldn't even get his driver's license. You know, he was years yes. away from it. So, yeah, it's the world has changed a lot. But, uh, wow, Bug Eye Sprite, uh, race vintage <laughs> racing and saw a bunch of those run. Those are those are what I call darling little cars. They're like little frogs, right? <laughs> they are like little frogs. That's a great description. And back in the day, there were... I don't know, there were like 20, 25 of them on the grid. You know, it was like Miatas today. Yeah. Very much so. So it was an interesting car. It was inexpensive. Well, in the day, I think I, I think it cost me $400. And <laughs> wow. in the day, I didn't have $400. Sure. So it was an interesting purchase and then an interesting way to get started. Uh, I wouldn't change a thing. It was great. Well, as they say, you come a long way, baby. And you've done <laughs> a lot of things since then. So let me give you an introduction and we're going to talk about this life you've had. Pretty glorious life. Tom Agloy has had a career in the racing world that spans decades of driving and owning race teams and has competed in virtually every part of motor racing, including IndyCar, Trans Am, Formula Atlantic, Super V, IMSA, Formula 2, NASCAR, and Corvette Challenge, to name just a few. And of course, Bug Eye Sprites, as you mentioned. <laughs> earlier his drivers have included very famous and uh, uh, substantially successful names including dorsey schroeder ron fellows butch leisinger paul newman yeah that guy walter payton wow bruce jenner juan fangio the second not the first <laughs> he's been around for a while but not that long <laughs> lindsay james who has been on the show here three times Cody, god tony tony canon uh, the ever smiling tony canon and many many others his sponsors are some of the biggest names in racing tom is owned and developed the Thermal Motorsports Park. We've had guests from that wonderful facility on the show. He's been a real estate investor, a developer, and a classic car collector. And in 2021, he was inducted into the West Coast Hall of Fame. Congratulations. We'll be back in just a moment, but first a word from our sponsor. So give them a little love and we'll be right back. Buckle up. We're with Tom today. We'll be right back. Covercraft's newest five-layer indoor cover is especially engineered for indoor use, providing maximum dust protection when your vehicle's stored in the garage. Your five-layer indoor cover is custom-tailored with Covercraft's attention to detail, form, and fit with the quality and attention to detail that's been their standard since 1965. Even if your vehicle is always inside, dust and fallout can damage the paint, and an extra layer of soft, Breathable material protects from accidental bumps and rubs. Covercraft protects cars, trucks, motorcycles, RVs, trailers, and watercraft too. Every one of my vehicles is protected with a Covercraft cover. 
custom fit to fit the car like a glove. And I have a deal for you. If you use the code YEAH21 at Covercraft.com, you'll get 10% off your order plus free shipping. That's right, 10% off and free shipping. Simply use the code YEAH, Y-E-A-H-21, at checkout. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. I was tired of my rates for my collector car insurance going up every year for no explainable reason. My carrier seemed to be turning into a media company versus an insurance company, and I realized that a portion of my policy premium was paying for all those so-called free media goodies. So I did my homework, I talked to knowledgeable collectors, shopped around, and discovered American Collectors Insurance. They've been serving the collector car hobby since 1976. You last that long by properly serving your customers' insurance need, not with a lot of fluff. ACI is ranked the number one online collector car insurance provider according to Google, Trustpilot, Facebook, and they offer their real person guarantee live support. No never-ending phone loops when you need help. Plus, because you don't use your classic car as a daily driver, you could save up to 40% compared to regular auto insurance. American Collectors Insurance provides agreed value policies. So if you experience a total loss to your collector vehicle or it's stolen, you'll be paid the amount listed on your declaration page, less any deductibles, of course. No ifs, ands, or buts. Give them a call today and ask for your free quote at 866-A-C-I-Y-E-A-H. That's 866-224-9324. Tell them you're a friend of mine, Mark Greens, at Cars Yeah. American Collectors Insurance, classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. So, Tom, we are back. Let's dive deeper into the corner, something you've done many times in your life. I'd like to kind of take us back. You talked about your first step into racing and that little bug eye sprite, but you created an incredible career in a very challenging world of racing. Talk about how you got into this, why it was important to you, and then we can kind of walk through some of the different series that you've raced. Now, if we talked about them all, we'd be here for a couple of days, I think. But racing, I mean, what a career you've had. It's incredible. So take us on a little bit of a journey. Well, racing, you, as you said, we could talk about this for a long time because racing is such a difficult thing. It requires money of some kind, which means sponsorship. So when I started, I had no idea that I would make a career out of it. I went racing in my little Sprite because it was fun. I enjoyed the heck out of it. I loved the people. I never, really never thought about that I could do this for a living. Then as things progressed a little bit, and even in the SCCA different classes, I, you know, I moved on to Formula Ford and you know, I started to have some ability. I had graduated from Indiana University and came back to California right away because I'm a California boy and bought my first Formula Ford, campaigned that up and down the West Coast, had a real job with Transamerica Corporation. You know, then after a few years of that job, they were very good to me. They let, gave me a lot of extra time to, you know, like an extra Friday here or there or a Monday to tow home or something. And then finally they came to me and they said, you know, this has all been good and we love the notoriety and all that sort of thing. But, you know, you're going to have to make a choice here. You, you <laughs> yeah. know, this car racing thing is good, but you're really going to have to make a choice. And so that was a hard decision. But at the same time, it was that classic deal like, well, if I don't give this a run now, I never will. Right. So they gave me a year's leave of absence. And the only way I knew that leave of absence was over was, I mean, they were really good people. And uh, a check arrived in the mail about a year later. And that was my, I don't know, my, whatever you call it. Farewell. Yeah, space. there you go. <laughs> and, um, and so then I was on my own and, and you know, difficult several years there yeah. doing a limited uh, amount, uh, you know, would do a couple of Atlantic races, for instance, uh, in Canada, where you could actually make money in those days if you ran at the front. And fortunately, I had some success, but I never had enough to continue the entire series. So I went on that way for a while. And then finally, things really started to happen. And that is that, you know, people came into my life that had the ability to make me successful and believed in me very well. And so you know, the first one was a guy by the name of Joe Lane from up in your neck of the woods, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Joe was a shopping center developer, very enthusiastic guy. And once I started to get a little bit of success, this is a sidelight 
uh, fathers would come to me and say, oh, my God, I've, my son's racing and I don't know how to get him you know, to the next level and I can't really afford it. And this, you know, what, what, tell me what to do. Right. And my first line and, and my most famous line would be paint your car yellow. And they would look <laughs> at me like, are you crazy? And I said, well, cause what happened to me and how Joe Lane found me was, um, in Formula Atlantic, I was running at the front in, uh, at Long Beach. I think I ended up second that year and I was on my own nickel completely wow. Run the car in my garage, et cetera, et cetera against some really great guys who have all now become very close friends. And anyway, Joe was sponsoring a car that was also yellow, but running at the back. And he brought up uh, like 20 of his employees down from Seattle and they were in the grandstands. And every time I came by, he'd stand up and cheer. And his secretary, Sandy, would grab him by the coattails and pull him back down and say, wrong car. Not us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so that went on and, you know, I ended up second or something. And then we went up to uh, Westwood in, in Vancouver, B.C. And uh, the same thing. You know, I'm at the front and now he's closer to home. So to, to end that story, he he requested a meeting with me. And, you know, like it was part of the yo-yo syndrome, which is the uh, for me was, you know, you're going to have a sponsor and then you're not going to have a sponsor. Oh, yeah. It's up and it's down. And, and every race car driver goes through that forever. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, he's, he, he took me into a meeting. He said, I'm going to sponsor you. I'm going to give you what you want or what you think you need to be successful because I think you can do it. And uh, I said, oh, this is so great. I'm like second in points or something right now. This will be a great season. He said, I don't start in the middle of every anything. I start at the beginning. So that meant the next year. So the yo-yo went back down, oh, you yeah, know. Yeah. And <laughs> anyway, the end result was Joe Lane was a phenomenal guy and uh we went. We started the series in 1979, and and uh, you know I went to Long Beach. Sat. I don't know if I sat on pole or not, but I won the race, and then uh, we ended up winning the series. I mean, Joe just he did. He gave me what I needed. He believed in me, and I had some phenomenal people work for me. Um, and that started the whole process. From there, it it multiplied itself into doing multiple cars for because we were successful and that's how it balanced out for Joe a bit we you know we had teammates that came along with sponsorship and we did those cars for them in addition to me racing and then he was an organizer he exposed me to several different situations meaning you know in the, in 1980 which was the year after the championship I'm still doing Atlantic but I also did um uh, let me think about this. I did a little bit of Formula Two. I did some IndyCar. We went to Macau. And I still ended up, I think I ended up second in the Atlantic Series, even though I missed at least three races. The, the opportunities, and they grew from there. You know, there were, uh, I'll cut this off so you can, so, so I'm not occupying too much of this. But after that step, then later on became the Ford step. And that was another huge situation. When you think about that pivotal moment in your career, and there were many others moving forward, and I've had hundreds of racers who, who've said uh, exact same things you're saying, these up and downs. I mean, one weekend, I always say one weekend you're a champ, the next weekend you're a chump. And yep. it's it's like acting or sports or any of it's, you know, it's a It's a yo-yo. That's a good way to put it. But when you think about these pivotal moments that led you to next steps, what would you say would be a key attribute of that? In my mind, from what I keep hearing from racers and team owners, which relates to the word business, is treating this like a business. This gentleman you just mentioned, he treated this not as he was into racing and he wanted to throw money at guys. This was part of his business plan, right? Exactly. Is that the, the key pivotal point there for you in your mind of running teams? It, and, and it, is, it is the key. I mean, I go all the way. I mean, I go all the way back to when I ran a Formula Ford. I started a little business prepping Formula Fords for other people because I needed that money to spend on myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It wasn't really that the money was going to go in a pocket anywhere. It, right. And so I had a little history of knowing about the business side. I had a degree in business. But what, what he, you know, what he, the way he presented it and the way he followed through on it, Every nickel that I spent, you know, had to be approved and had to be approval meant that you had to explain why. Well, that's great. You know, this is not just a free for all. And so in the end, what happened, which is sort of interesting, too, because it taught me some lessons. He sponsored me for a couple of years. He opened up some incredible doors for me. And then at the end of the second year, he came to me and he said, OK, 
I'm going to sponsor a boy golfer and a girl golfer. And I said, oh, that's really cool. He says, yeah, but I'm moving on. I'm done with racing. I'm done with racing. Yikes. And I'm like devastated. Right. Um, like, and he said, well, I'm going to sell you the business. And, and I said, oh. <laughs> what would I buy that with? Yeah. And he said, don't worry, we'll work that out. A businessman. He was a businessman. Yeah. Yeah. And so he created a situation for me, which was, uh, all, you know, very important in the long run. It, it taught me so many different things. The only thing is I ended up without a ride. But we had numerous customers, and, and by that time, we were doing Super Vs. We were doing Formula Atlantics, like three of them, um, you know, for, for people. Just multiple things going on, but I ended up without a ride. I had a business, but no ride. Well, I love business, but I'm a racer. <laughs> well, yeah, no kidding. You know, it leads to a nice, a nice segue for my next question I ask all my guests, and that is what I call a driving inspiration, a mentor, an influential person. I mean, even in this business so long, there's probably so many on your list. But is there one that kind of stands out for you that took you to a next level at some point along your career? I mean, what you just said was a, a great one because he taught you an incredible lesson, right? From oh, he being did. just a driver. And I, I say just with big quotes around it. Nothing wrong with that. But to being a team owner, hold up. I mean, you look at people like Bobby Rahal and Penske and these huge names that have figured out how to make that transition into a career in a business, the Andretti's. I mean, I can go on and on, right? I mean, you've been in that world. Well, and everybody that you mentioned right there has had an effect on me in a major way. In some cases, Bobby Rahal, for instance, we met for the first time at the first Atlantic race both of us did in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Everybody was just a kid. You know, there was Sullivan and Kogan and Bill Brack and Villeneuve and I mean, it, the list goes on, yeah. and, but we were all kids, you know, we were all equal and we were wet behind the ears and we were just trying to find a way. And, you know, and so I think that's why we got better also, because the competition was so strong. We didn't know it was strong, but well, we, all it was. Yeah. we wanted to win. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and so we've all remained good buds as time's gone on, but it's hard for me to pick another exact person, just as you stated, because there are so many. Mr. Penske, Roger, taught me quite a few things, and I have the highest degree of respect for him. Bobby also taught me a lot. We became partners in a race team and things, and he was my presenter at the Hall of Fame. Oh, nice. You know, we're talking, we've known each other 45 years now, and, and so all of those kinds of relationships have continued with all of these guys, and including Danny, who I guess is... Uh, Sullivan, who's going to do a deal at Laguna Seca here in, in another couple of weeks. That's where what I hear, yeah. Yeah, right. So the whole list, I can go back to individual people at Ford Motor Company who had a faith. There was a guy by the name of Len Pounds. Nobody hardly will remember this name, but Len wrote the book. They had a, they had an Eng, he was English, and they had a, a Formula Ford book, and it was like the handbook of Formula Ford. It was orange in color. I think I've got one somewhere. It's it's a real collector's item. Yeah. Anyway, when I ended up at Ford, I was asked to go drive a Mustang that was having a lot of trouble. I, it was in the period where I didn't have a ride, so I took it immediately. Car was pretty diabolical, to be honest. But Len Pounds, this was Ford re-entering the Trans Am series after being out for a number of years. And they, they hooked onto this little program. And the driver was not so good. They called me to see if I, I was, at that point, an open-wheel guy, not a closed-wheel yeah. guy. But anyway, I was happy to do it. But Len Pounds was the guy who was in charge of the program at Ford. Well, I, his faith in me and uh, was, you know, as we progressed, we only did about six races, the last six in, the, in that year. And we progressed from diabolical, and I'm sure this car is <laughs> going to kill me, but I didn't want to tell anybody that, yeah. to sitting on pole and winning the last race. Wow. I mean, it was a, and that was a progression of people also, meaning... The three guys that were in charge of that car were incredible and actually very renowned in the business. Um, a couple of them passed away since then, since, but I mean, really renowned histories. And Lynn came to me afterward on the behalf of Ford and said at the last race and said, would you take over this program? And I <laughs> was like, really? So take, not drive, take over the whole program. Drive it and take it over. Oh my gosh. Like because they knew we, we had a shop capable of doing, you know, wow. construction, et cetera. So Lynn becomes, you know, I mean, certainly there was Michael Cranifus and there were, you know, several other uh, people and, and 
I, I, I duly credit Edsel Ford too because he's such a wonderful individual. But and I could go on and on because there's different different people had such an effect about keeping a person above water, and I don't mean financially. I mean kind of mentally. You know, oh, like sure. keep it going. Don't don't complain about why you didn't get that ride. Go find another one. And uh, that positivity, I think, is what helps you in any business, any time. It's easy to get down, and we all do. But, you know, you can't stay there very long because a lot's going on. You know, it, it reminds me of one of my guests, a racer, who said when he didn't have a ride, he would go to races and bring his suit and his helmet. As he said, you never knew when you might get tossed into a car. And That's exactly right. You got to have that attitude. It's going to happen today. You just walk around, you meet people. Great yeah. story, by the way. I think you could share a lot more. We're going to take a short pit stop here. Thank our sponsors again. And we come back. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the challenge question I asked all my guests. Uh, I'm sure you have a lot of those to pick from as well. So <laughs> keep that thought in mind. We'll refuel, retire, and we'll be right back. Auto Geeks Blackfire SiO2 Spray Sealant. It's a spray-on, wipe-off sealant that's quick, safe, and easy to clean and protect your vehicles. I love using it on all my cars. Auto Geek's Blackfire SiO2 Spray Sealant is a spray-on, wipe-away sealant that uses SiO2 ingredients to provide a slick, brilliant, and long-lasting shine. Silicon dioxide is known to be one of the most effective ingredients in car care products, and Blackfire Spray Sealant takes advantage of of every stunning feature it has to offer. This sealant will protect your paint from road film, dirt, and other common contaminants while providing an impeccable, long-lasting hydrophobic surface that forces water to sheet and bead on your paint for months. Go to autogeek.net to get yours and for the best product selections on the internet today, along with their skilled technical support. Autogeek.net is where I go for all my detailing needs. That's autogeek.net. Check them out today. I've discovered Linkage. It's a new quarterly publication and website that covers the automotive market, driving, restoring, collecting, and discovering your passion for motor vehicles. Linkage is about experiences, opinions, and values. Linkage is an actual informed, reasoned opinion based on firsthand experiences. A talented Linkage team covers the automotive world the people who share your passion and mine, smart, considered, rational, and experienced opinions, ones you can learn from and grow. That includes our passion that drives auctions and the collector car market. So come with me and join us on this journey. And be sure to use the code CARS YEAH when you subscribe, and they'll give you $10 off. Boom! Linkage, geared. For the automotive life. Subscribe today at LinkageMag.com. Cars yeah is proud to support our veterans, which is why I've teamed up with our nonprofit partner, Tech Force Foundation, through its Veterans at Work Military Transition Campaign. The tech shortage is very real, and our country needs skilled, qualified techs to keep our cars, trucks, airplanes, and fleets rolling. When so many vets build their skills in maintaining and servicing vehicles when deployed, TechForce helps transition those skills to jobs as professional technicians when they come home. Learn more about TechForce Foundation and its Veterans at Work Military Transition Fund at techforce.org today. So, Tom, uh, geez, this is almost a ridiculous question for racing industry people, racers, team owners, challenges. But I want you to pick one huge one that really kind of set you back on your heels. Maybe it was a point in time you went, I've chosen the wrong career. I got to go do something different. But walk us through that challenge. But more importantly, what did it teach you? Because that's what these challenges are all about in life, teaching us so we can move on. So take us on a bit of a rough ride maybe even into a wall somewhere in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, not too many of those, but Good. a few for sure. Good. Yeah. Part, of the, part of the business. Mm -hmm. You know, I would have to say that the biggest challenge through my whole uh, career was finding money. And, <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah, and, and every kid talks about it, every older racer talks about it. Until you reach a certain point, then you're not, I mean, it's still it's still applicable today. You reach a certain point and you're you're really not in charge of finding the money. But that really means that you reach some echelon. But the more money that you find, even when you're at that echelon, is 
more money that makes it your car or your team or whatever more successful and has more to spend. And I know I'm sounding a bit ruthless here, but it is a ruthless business. You want to have everything that you possibly can. I remember in my early days, people used to really, they still make fun of me for this, but my early days when I had my little Formula Ford shop, you know, to have a nylock nut, those things were like a quarter a piece. <laughs> sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I had not a lot of those, right? But they kept disappearing. I don't know what was happening, but, you know, how would I even know they were disappearing? Well, because there was only two or three of us in the whole place. Sure. And um, whatever was happening was happening. That taught me something. And what it taught me was you don't need to worry about how many nylock nuts there are. You need to worry about the money that you're going to need to buy more of them. And so it's two ends of the coin. And that thoroughly applies to motor racing, meaning – the sponsorship um, that you're able to acquire not only gives the company all the assets and, and necessary items to make you successful, but it also gives you a bit of a living, which is kind of a good thing to eat once in a while. Yes. And um, so I'd have to say money was the biggest challenge. And in my case, I probably was more successful, especially early in, in relationship building. Yeah, yeah, which meant a lot. You know, I went to Indy on a relationship, really. I was called up. Uh, I, was doing the, I was doing the Trans Am series for Ford, and, and one of the guys from the original Trans Am program that I spoke about right in the beginning, um, one of the three guys, was working for an IndyCar team, a very famous um, uh, fabricator, and his name was Ian, Ian Gordon. And um, he... he worked for this IndyCar team, which was Rick Gallus at the time, and Al Jr. was the driver, and they had a, they had a sponsor. They had a Simonize, oh. and they needed to do a three or four race deal, and how my name came up, I really don't know. I had done a few races for Penske back in, I think, 1980, 81, somewhere in there, and, uh, and, it, and it had gone well, but I didn't end up with the, the ride, uh, because that was the years of um, it's a segue, sorry, but it's <laughs> uh, it was the years of Mario Andretti, Bobby Unser, and Rick Mears. Well, yeah. I got to drive a little bit. I, I was assisted by Roger, is the best way to put it. Uh -huh. um, when Mario would be off doing Formula One, and they and they had extra stuff. Oh, sure. I didn't mm -hmm. exactly get Mario's car, but <laughs> uh, and that was smart because if I'd wrecked it, that would have been horrible. Um, but yeah, anyway, maybe. <laughs> but that guy put put my name in to the team manager and to Rick. And I got a call yeah. and, you know, it was fabulous. Like, oh, do you want to do Indy? Really? Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to ask. And then I had to go to Ford to make a deal because one, there was a conflict on one of the dates. And, and Ford was very good with me um, about that. And in the end, I couldn't do the last race for the, for the IndyCar team because I was leading a championship in, in Trans Am. And that was the deal. If I was leading, I couldn't do it. Sure. So, but I got to do Indy and, and a couple other races. So. Wow. You know, the big value bomb you dropped for listeners out there in any field that are listening to this today is something that a mentor taught me very early in my career when I was in my 20s. I was working in advertising. He was a developer, big real estate developer. And one day I had lunch with him. He was a very nice guy, kind of took me under his wing. And he said, I said, how do you do all these projects? I mean, he's doing a high rise in downtown San Diego and a shopping center over here and something in Arizona. And I, how do you do all this stuff? And he said, Mark, you need to learn it's not working in your business, it's working on it all the time. Someone else is doing all that for me. I'm working on the next five deals that are coming down the road. And it it really, for me, young guy, I was doing stuff instead of working on the future. And it really clicked in my head finally. He gave it to me in a way, but that's essentially what you said, right? Yeah, it's exactly, it. it was interesting when it finally clicked for me because you need to be, you don't need to be looking down Right. Up in Maybe the looking out. Up on the mast in the uh, yeah. crow's nest. Yeah, yeah. He gave me the other. The, you, it's funny you say that because I know you've been in real estate development too. He said, you can't be the guy rowing. You have to be up in the crow's nest telling the rowers where to row. Otherwise, if you're down in the hole rowing, you'll row right into the rocks. Yeah. Because you can't <laughs> see you can't see what's coming. And there's another great analogy to what you just shared. So awesome story. You know, I want you to share a story of a special vehicle in your life. Now, this could be one race car that you got in and said, how did I get here? Uh, some kind of story that really stands out for you. You've been around a lot of cool cars, driven a lot of cool cars. Uh, but what would that vehicle be for you? 
Wow, that's a, that, that's kind of a hard question because I had um, I had a couple cars that were a real special to me, and obviously I was successful. That's kind of how that works sometimes. I think um, one was an Atlantic car that uh, that I won the championship with, and um, I had a guy by the name of Graham Donaldson, famous mechanic, um, as my crew chief, and we worked on that thing, and we did stuff to that which I I smile to. Uh, today um, to see, some of the things we figured big, out. I see something coming back in your skull here today. A big <laughs> smile in your... What, what year was that? That was 1979. Okay. You know, that was the year that we won the championship. But that particular car, I tested that car and I ran it everywhere. And we, we were just fortunate. We had our shops at Sears Point or near Sears Point, And, um, you know, we would go over there and run. I mean, you know, like just... Okay, we got a few things to try. We'd go over there for a couple hours and come back. Great track, too. Great track. Good, good. It, it just handles a whole lot of different uh, aspects of car racing. And so that car, that car for me, I had a choice the following year, 1980, to get a new car. I didn't do that. You know, I mean, I, th- I think actually we, we might have gotten one, but I didn't use it. I used that car again. And um, uh, I took it to Macau and... And, uh, you know, we did a, a couple of years in Macau where they we had this huge sponsorship. I mean, huge. It's just one of those things that came along. Dunhill Cigarettes and Flying Tigers, the old uh, oh, yeah. cargo airline. And I led that race. I didn't win it. Something broke with a lap or two to go, but I was gone. And i never forget that, right? So the next year we went back because we got the sponsorship again. And I wasn't as I, – I just couldn't quite pull it off. I finished third, but, you know, it's just so fun. But the point I'm trying to make is I used that car through all of that stuff. And at that point, ground effect cars were starting to come in. And I still stuck with this flat bottom. And um, it was it was spectacular. This, this other car is my championship Trans Am car, and it was the same thing. We developed this car, and uh, Bob Riley was the designer of it, and it was, you know, it was highly successful. And uh, you know, Jack Roush had his multi-car team. Well, we had our own, and we won the championship. And next year, Jack won it, of course. But I don't say of course; it was well, it was well contested. But um, that car again was. I did a couple years in Trans Am in that in that same car, and I definitely was given another car to use. And it was interesting because uh, Dorsey Schrader, who drove for me a, a bunch of years later, maybe 10 years later, um, when I was just a team owner, we uh, built ju- him a car. Just a team owner? <laughs> yeah, just a team owner. And we built him a car. And Dorsey, wonderful guy, and drove for me for a number of years. And he took the same, the first car that we gave him, and then every year we would give him a new one. And he'd take it out and he'd test it in the beginning of the season, and he'd come back to the old one. You know, it's just that, so it's interesting about, you talk about cars and favorites and things, but from the racing side, those two were my, really my favorites. There were some cars that would, that would hit my ultimate hate list. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. But we won't talk about those. No, no, <laughs> we'll ignore those. So I'm going to be your car psychologist today. I'm going to crawl into your head a little bit here and ask you a question that maybe no one's ever asked you. If you were reincarnated, excuse the pun, or manifest as a vehicle, what would you be and why? And this isn't about what you want to be. This is you perceiving the man in the mirror, who you are, what you've done in your life as an actual vehicle. And I like asking racers this question because you don't always get a race car for an answer. Yeah, and you wouldn't for me either. Uh, You know, this subject is kind of interesting because all guys are, I think racers are different, quite a bit different. Um, I've been around so many of them. And when you're out in in public or you're out driving or, you know, just driving around, going to the race from the motel or the hotel or whatever. It's interesting the rides I've had with other drivers driving. Okay. And they've hit the full gamut of everything. And so I don't fit the scheme very well. I'm not the fastest guy on the, on the road, you know, the street. And now that I've gotten older, of course I'm not. Mainly because what I see going on around me is like, you yeah, know, may guy's got no clue how, how close he is to death, you yeah, know, yeah, <laughs> or, yeah. Or, or maiming somebody. Get off your phone, please. <laughs> yeah, well, not even just that, just the activity in and out of lanes and, you know, how close they get and blah, blah, blah. So I guess I would see myself or my ideal car is it used to be something pretty fast and flashy because they were fun, you know, and, and, uh, but now I've I've come kind of full circle to where I just want a nice car. I just want to I just want effortless 
uh, running, you know, nothing that's going to break down, blah, blah, blah. Sure. So, you know, I mean, honestly, my favorite car right at the moment, and I do have a collection of cars, but, but I bought one as a, as a streeter um, that I'm driving a lot well, after I drive my Ford. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> you got to plug uh, them. <laughs> I bought a Targa. I bought a Targa from a 90, a uh, Porsche Targa, like 2015 or 16 from a 90-year-old guy. And this 90-year-old guy, this car was impeccably maintained. He had been a long-time Porsche guy, and he just couldn't drive it anymore. And so it had a grand total of 15,000 miles on it. Oh, score. And it's beautiful. And I love just getting in it and tootling around. So to be honest, that's kind of me. I was going to tell you it was going to be like an Isetta or something, you know, three wheels (laughs) and, you know, I could tip it over easy. (laughs) But no, I mean, that's honest, the honest answer. So, well, I know you're a Porsche guy and, you know, Sean Cridlin, who suggested and connected us today. Thank you, Sean. He's brought some great guests to the show. Um, And uh, actually, I'm going to be doing a little promotion for him of his Brumos book, which is just a stunning series. He's a great guy. Great writer. Great photographer. Oh, yeah. In so many ways. In fact, he's, he's sending me, I talked to him this morning. He's sending me a, a cool picture he says he has of you so you may see that on your show notes page we'll see what it turns out to be but you know i'm a porsche guy too and i've, I've had many porsches and i've got a 87 turbo right now i call my orange crush it was a paint to sample one of only three cars ever painted wow in a metallic pearl orange color and wow i haven't mentioned this publicly but i'm thinking about letting it go and getting a newer porsche that is like what you just said, something that I can just jump in and drive, not worry about. Um, these old collector cars have become valuable. They're a little bit of an albatross sometimes because you don't want to leave them parked somewhere. And, you know, they're little. Those old Porsches are small compared to the giant SUVs that are trying to crush you on the road every day. Well, it, and you're absolutely right. The new Porsches, you know, there's it's it's still a 911 logo. But the car is twice as big. It's a big car. Yeah. It's a big car, rel- you know, relatively speaking. And uh, it's, it is it is interesting. Um, it's interesting, your description, too, because Sean did an article at, on in Panorama. on my, uh, I had an original 58, 1958 Porsche Speedster. I, and I, by and, the way, Tom, I'm super yeah. jealous because that's been my – I was born in 58. I've always wanted a 58 Speedster. They've become unobtainium. Um, yes. And quite honestly, when you drive one compared to, let's say, a John Wilhoit build yeah. or a Emery Outlaw build, you kind of go, I think I – don't want something that slow. Yeah, I, I, I'll put a link on, on Tom Shona's page for you listeners to that article that Sean sent me. It's a great article, and, and what a cool car. It's a cool car, and I, I am fortunate. I, I, did some, um, I did some restoration work. I restored a uh, uh, 1940 Ford. I'm a hot rod guy, too. And um, a 1940 that. Ford that, uh, that the Emery family, speaking of Rod Emery, his his grandfather built in the forties. Really, and uh, whoa! And I ran into this car, and it was it was in bad shape. And I, but I fell in love with it. And it had taken they had taken a six inch section out of the out of the car all the way around the body, and then dropped it down and welded the two together. Well, in those days, all they had were gas torches. I mean, the workmanship was unbelievable. So I ended up which I'll never do again, and I swore I would never do to start with, but they had a hot rod class at Pebble Beach. And so I was going to restore this anyway, so I made this crazy decision. Well, if I'm going to restore it anyway, maybe I should take it to Pebble. And, well, now I know that there's a real difference between restoring it and restoring it to take to Pebble. Oh, yeah. Don't um, kidding. Yeah. Ugh. Oh, yeah. But, but it turned out phenomenally, and, uh, and I got to know the Emory family. That's a short segue again for – the fact that I have now one of Rod's cars. Wow. And, wow. Uh, so that, I, you know, yes, you're right. The, the speedster is, is it's a whole different genre. Yeah. The, the old speedster, you know, I've driven it everywhere. Um, I mean, literally up and down the state of California and into Nevada, up and around. And I had it everywhere. And, and then, you know, you just kind of reached a point and then I got in this Emery and it was like, <laughs> yes. oh my God, this brings back, this brings back the old days. Yeah. I need this. I yeah. got to have this and, uh, and I love it. So, yeah, uh, but, but I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't call it what it would, uh, you know, as we were talking before, it's not what would define me because I'm, I'm, I'm where you're at. You know, I want something completely reliable, just fun, get in, don't worry about it and go. Yeah. You know, I like to ask guests about a great book and I, I'd be remiss here again. Sean put us together this. He's been so many great books. He's been on my show, I think 
twice, maybe three times now, uh, along with the Hurley book when he and Hurley were on the show. Uh, he was on the show when the Brumos book came out. But I, I really want to push that here a little bit more because my set is arriving today, by the way. I'm watching. Oh, the there you go. Right? Yeah, I'm really excited about it getting here. It's an insane series of books. And you being a car guy and that Brumos legacy, right. that's got to be a book of choice for us today, right, Tom? Well, it is for sure. There's no doubt about it. And and the amount of work, the things, I know I know pieces of that um, history, but some of the things that have come up via investigation, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, it's, it's mind boggling for a racer, especially. It's great info and great reading. And uh, so, yeah, no, I think, and I, I mean, I first met Hurley at Daytona. I don't remember the year, a long time back. And the reason I met him, I knew, you know, I'd seen him, but we really hadn't gotten close at all, you know, um, and I was just uh, doing some of the longer distance races for, for somebody, Ford or somebody, I'm not sure. He drove into the Daytona track in a five window, 1932, five window Ford coupe. What? And yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, I saw this and I saw him get out. That was it. I had to go ask meet, him. So. Meet him, yeah. Yeah. And I said, wow, where did you get this? He said, oh, I got it from this guy, Roy Brizio. And he, and I said, Roy Brizio? Yeah, who's that? He said, come on, you dummy. He lives out by you he, in San Francisco area. And he built it and da da da. And, you know, so anyway, he, I ended up, Roy and I are now great friends and everything and, and had a couple cars, but it was, it was just interesting in regard to Hurley and even his diversity, you know, um, yeah. like, yeah, I'm going to have a hot rod. I'm, I'm going to have a hot rod and, <laughs> yeah. and all that kind of thing. Um, and the book, you know, the book, it just covers so many different aspects. Um, very, very interesting life. Uh, very happy for him and all the success that's happened. Yeah, so. I'd encourage you listeners. These are two books you should have on your shelf. If you're any kind of a car person, uh, the Hurley book, which is incredible history of his life and wonderful. And then, of course, the Brumos book, which is a combination of racing and history and legacy and how this whole thing and if you haven't listened to the show when uh, Sean was on my show, go back and listen to me because he talks about how it grew from one book to f now it's four. As this whole series of books. So uh, I'm super excited about showing up today. Of course, no one's going to see me for the next couple of weeks because I'm going to go hide and read the whole thing, but uh, <laughs> it'll be fun. So before I let you go today, I'm going to let you go on the ultimate drive. I'm going to buy you any car in the world. I'm going to be like your ultimate dream sponsor. I'm going to be the guy that goes, you know what, Tom, whatever you need. I'm going to provide it. Yeah. Look at the smile on his face. <laughs> so here's the deal. You can pick any car in the world. You can be driving anywhere in the world and you can be with anybody in the world, even somebody who's past. So somebody from the past. So what does that ultimate drive look like for a guy who's had so many ultimate drives? Well, that's a, that's a good question. That's a really tough answer too. Uh, <laughs> the car is easy. Okay. You know, I would do it in, in the old, uh, three seat McLaren. The F1. Yes. Ooh. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> you're going to cost, you're not a cheap date, Tom. This is going to cost me. <laughs> you see, yeah, you're right. It's going to cost you a lot. You, no kidding. They weren't that expensive a few years back, but boy, they've caught up in a hurry. Oh my gosh. They've become the new GTO of collector yes. cars. Well, I did an IndyCar team for a guy by the name of Larry Blair. And uh, that's a story all in its own. Wonderful guy. I didn't want to do it. I had my own teams. I didn't want to go to work for somebody. He made it impossible for me to turn it down. And it turned out to be so much fun. And um, we had a driver by the name of Alex Barron. And we did very well for a, a rookie new team. Anyway, he had the F1. And he, had, he was ahead of the game. He had sourced it out of Australia. It was one of the prototypes. He sent it back to McLaren. This is pre-me. Sent it back to McLaren. Had it redone. You know, had it for quite a long time, and he <laughs> he took me for a ride in it one day in San Jose, California, on the street. And uh, <clears throat> well, I hope Larry's not listening, but <laughs> wow, wow, yeah, we were going a little too fast for the circumstances. And I'm in one of those seats because you know that it's it's a center seat and two two, two kind of uh, sitting back seats a little to the bit. rear. Yeah, I'm in one of the ones to the rear, and. Uh, Anyway, the car was extremely impressive, and that's, so that's been my car. You know, I, I would say that um, he subsequently sold that a little bit too early, unfortunately, well, but um, it, it does, yeah. Can't keep him forever. No. Nope. I'm not sure who the occupant would be. I mean, one of the, you know, one of the, one of the intriguing guys to me really is Roger Penske. Oh, gosh, yeah. I know him a little bit. Uh 
and I know uh, his worth ec- ethic and et cetera, and, and, and what he expects from his people, very high, but fair, I think. And um, I just think that, you know, what he's experienced and what he's, um, you know, where he sees himself and how he's gotten there, I think it's an incredible story. Oh, it's, and, yeah. Magic. And so I think for him, for me, that would probably be the guy. There's there's so many that it could be, um, honestly. Well, you got two extra seats. Maybe there's a second person to balance well, things out. Yeah, well, that would be interesting. So just out of the blue, a guy's name came. <laughs> most guys will laugh at this one. Okay. Um, Ron Tarnack was oh, the guy yeah. who, yeah, he was Ralt, uh, Ralt Cars in England. And he was a crusty devil. <laughs> um, and and I, you know, I... I won my championship here in, in Ralts. We became close friends because of the success. He invited me to do Formula 2 in Europe in a car that was brand new and being developed for, for Honda. It was Honda's return to racing after their, for, their Richie Ginther Formula 1 days. Then they dropped out. Then they decided they were going to come back. And they came back via Formula 2. They went to, to Ralt, who had a, built a car for it. I did the initial testing in between <laughs> flying back and forth there to England in between doing a bunch of other things. And it, in the end, some, some guy, I, I couldn't do the season. I was committed. And some guy named Nigel Mansell. Oh, that guy. Know, yeah. Some guy. Yeah. Um, he got the ride. And um, later in the season, uh, he, uh, he got injured. And that was the back in the days, remember, where we didn't have cell phones and we didn't have all this instant communication that we have today. So I read about it. Nobody called me to tell me about it, uh, except what Tarnak finally did. Um, and you know, you read about it in motoring news or whatever it was, yeah, sure, right. Yeah. They don't explain anything. And so Tarnak calls me up and he said, Oh man, I really need you to do the last two F2 races. And I, and we looked at the dates and they were open. So I went, when I got there. It's when I found out that Mansell, well, somewhere in between, I found out Mansell had broken his leg, but nobody explained to me what had happened. I don't know why I'm off on this. Sorry. But, <laughs> okay. but we're a, at Anna. It's a cool in story. Italy, and we're doing this. And they got this flat out turn, just about flat out. I mean, you know, and so I decided I could do it. And uh, it worked up. You know, you work up to it. And finally, and I did I did two 360s in the middle of this track, oh. in the middle of this turn. Didn't hit anything and ended up going the same direction. Ended up in the pit lane, blah, blah, blah. Explained to Tarnak what had happened. He, he went white in the face. Because apparently it's exactly what Nigel had described. This was early form. This was early sliding skirt. You know. Oh, uh, so lost grip. Yeah, he lost grip for some reason. For some reason. So anyway, on the way home from there, Tarnak asked me to, and th- this he, his history. You know, his history goes through Brabham and and all of you know, just so great names. Great names, but also an interesting character because he would look at the world differently than say a, a Roger Penske. You know, yeah. he would have. The contrast would be, I think, would, would, would have been very, uh, very interesting. Okay. He offered me the Formula 2 ride for the following year on the way home in the airplane. I couldn't do it. I mean, I could do it, but I didn't do it. Um, and, and maybe I should have, maybe I shouldn't. But by then, I had like 20 guys working for me. Yeah, and sure. that would have meant, you know, that would have been hard to do. I couldn't. That would have guys, been working in the business, not on the business. Would have been working in it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And my guys would, you know, that would have been, you know, you develop relationships. And sometimes right. you have to, you know, you, you bite the bullet because people got you somewhere. You need to keep them going. Well, maybe so. you dodged a big bullet there. Yeah. So taking a bullet. So you've taken us on an amazing ride. I could talk to you forever. <laughs> Before I let you go, though, is there a success quote, a mantra, a uh, Words of wisdom you might leave our listeners with today when you think about your life in racing and business. Lucky. Lucky. <laughs> yeah, know, I think lucky. <laughs> I mean, I think you work you work your tail off. You, you know, and everybody, I think everybody that's successful does that. But somewhere along the line, there is a certain level of luck. You're in the right spot at the right time. You have the right conversation. Somebody remembers a conversation a little bit later. You get plugged into something. Uh, and so I just believe I've been lucky. And, um, and, I, and I think that's, you know, you're only lucky if you're in the right spot. And uh, you got to get yourself there. I was going to say in my world or my thought process, luck is when preparation, which is key to racing, collides with uh, opportunity. And that's what racing is all about, right? It is exactly what it's all about. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Is there a way for people to 
reach out to you or stay in touch with you or are you fully retired these days or someone tells me you'll never retire. I think you've got your hands in stuff all the time. Well, I th- you know, you, when you get older, you need that. You got to stay busy. You got to do your stuff. And, and so, yeah, I'm into real estate. I'm not into any real business of any kind. I don't have, you know, I've stayed away from, uh, you know, guys have said, why don't you historic race? It's hard for me because, you know, I had I had a good time racing in real cars and to do the historic thing. It's just not me, but I love going to the historic races and seeing all my old friends and all that kind of thing. That's as good as it gets. And, uh, well, maybe we just say we'll see you at the racetrack someday. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the best, the best way. I'm on Facebook uh, occasionally. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if somebody wants to give me a bad time, they can do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, otherwise ignore those naysayers. That's what I try to do. Amen to that. I keep Amen. saying, you know, you have an option in these social medias. You can ignore, scroll on past, unfollow, unfriend. Um, or just ignore it and go live your life. So lots of opportunities. Don't let them get you down, right? Amen. All yep. right. Very cool. Again, a big shout out to our mutual friend, Sean Cridlin, for connecting me with Tom today. This has been marvelous. Thank you, Sean. Can't wait for your books to arrive here any minute. Tom, <laughs> thanks for being so generous today with your time and sharing uh, just a small part of your incredible life around racing and cars. Until you and I talk again, as we said, I'll see you at a racetrack someday. Mark, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. It's fun. It's fun relieving a few of the old, uh, the old situations. Absolutely. This has been great. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!